Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Jake Strand. And I'm Tracy McRae. As we've discussed before on this program, individualized medicine is tailoring the diagnosis and treatment to each person based on their genomics. The Mayo Clinic Center for Individualized Medicine works to move the latest in genomic testing and therapies from the lab to the healthcare provider's office. Recently, there have been some pretty exciting advancements in cancer genomics, liquid biopsy, biomarkers, and CAR T-cell therapy, to name just a few. Here to help us understand what it all means, and if I said any of that incorrectly, is the director of the Center for Individualized Medicine at Mayo Clinic, Dr. Keith Stewart. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Stewart. Yeah, thank you. It's great to be here again. <laughs> Every time that you come to visit us, Dr. Stewart, um, it seems like you tell us, here's what's on the horizon, and then that's exactly where we're at the next time that you come to visit. So let's talk about um, cancer genomics. Are you talking about the genetics of the tumor? or of the patient? Well, initially, uh, genomic medicine was applied to the genomics of the tumor, but increasingly to the patient's uh, germline DNA, which is the DNA they're born with. In some ways, in many ways, in fact, um, genomic medicine has become standard of care in cancer. There are some types of cancer. Lung cancer comes to mind. Uh, some of the leukemias and blood cancers come to mind, which one wouldn't dream yeah. of treating a patient today without knowing some genetic information about the tumor itself. What is changing is we're moving from small gene panels into a much deeper, more integrated genomic approach where we look at the whole spectrum of the whole genome as opposed to just small parts of it. That's the latest, greatest thing that's coming soon um, to many places. Can you break that down for me a little bit? I'm the layperson here. I don't know if you understood that, Dr. Strand, but what? What did you just say? Well, in, in <laughs> the past, if you're a lung cancer doctor, you've been interested in seven genes which we know contribute to lung cancer and for which we may have a therapy or which may have prognostic significance. They may tell you how that cancer is going to behave. Uh, what we'd like to do now is to move away from just those seven genes to sequence the whole genome. The costs of doing that have plummeted uh, from billions of dollars at the beginning to just uh, thousands of dollars now, even hundreds of dollars in some cases. We've, with the latest technology, we think we can now shift some of our genetic testing to whole genomes so we don't just look at the seven genes, we look at all 20,000 genes that make up a tumor cell. It's, it really is an exciting time, and just somebody, I was on the hospital service this morning, we were talking about a patient's case that was really, what was going to happen next with that patient was driven in large part by what tests were coming back related to genomic information. So even now at the bedside, it's making significant difference in how we treat patients, how we talk to patients. I wonder, how are, how are you helping everyone keep track of all of this? Uh, well, it's a lot of education, a lot of uh, communication with our staff, uh, with the uh, medical meetings, the usual ways that we communicate the discoveries and advances. Um, one of the things that is also changing, though, is this, which you already brought up, Tracy, is that we, we've begun to understand that a far larger percentage of cancers than we used to appreciate, you're actually born at increased risk for. We used to think that was maybe 5% of cancers, but as we've sequenced the genomes of more patients, We've learned that for some cancers, it can be as high as 20% of cases are from particularly ovarian cancer, for example, are you're born with a predisposition to develop that cancer. So what we've decided that we're going to start doing soon is we're going to start sequencing the DNA you're born with, not just the DNA in the tumor cell. And we'll be able to identify if you were at increased risk from time of birth for development of cancer later in life. And we think up to 10 to 20% of all patients with cancer will fall into that camp. Once we've identified you as at risk, perhaps even before you've developed a cancer, or more importantly, your family members who are also affected have developed a cancer, we can put you in more intensive screening programs. We can devise therapeutic strategies to prevent. It could be surgical. They could be medication in the future. They could be vaccines in the future, ways to head off cancer. We like to think of it as intercepting cancer before it starts. And that's the liquid biopsy part that you talked about. So there's a blood draw. Is that what you, is that what you mean? No. Um, liquid biopsy is something a little bit different. Okay. What, what I mean is everybody's born with a component of DNA from your mother and father. And we believe that in people who develop cancer, 10 to 20% of the time, 
that the reason they've developed that cancer is partly because they were had an increased risk of that from time of birth because of the genetics they inherited from their parents. Hmm. That's the what we call the germline DNA. Mm-hmm. Cancer is a genetic disease. So when you develop cancer, it's because there's been a genetic mutation within a specific cell in your body. Now, we can, turns out, that as cancers grow and die and regrow, they shed DNA into the bloodstream. We've learned this looking at the DNA of babies that's present in the mother and subsequently applying that technology to, to tumors. That's what we call a liquid biopsy uh-huh. because if you can detect the tumor in a blood test, it means you don't have to go looking for it with x-rays or with needles. Uh, rather, we can find it. We can find it at a very high sensitivity, uh, often before the cancer is readily detectable, we think, by other conventional, before you develop symptoms. So, for example, if we know your increased risk for ovarian cancer and we, perhaps one of your family members has become at increased risk, we believe that one day, not too far away, we'll be able to draw a blood test and monitor you on an annual or biannual basis for the earliest signs of ovarian cancer or whatever cancer we're worried about, and we could therefore intervene early when it's still curable. How many different cancers are you talking about? All of them? I mean, like pancreatic cancer, um, usually, or uh, lung cancer, it has to be so far progressed before the signs and symptoms show up. So are you saying all cancers, or are there certain types? It turns out there's a sort of, the belief is, and and some of this still has to be proven, and we're doing many research studies to to try, and some of our very talented scientists here are are developing these tests. It turns out that there's probably a pan-cancer test which says, yes, a cancer is present. And for that, you might look at the most common cancer mutations in a panel of maybe 10 genes. Uh, But there's also beyond that, once you detect it, you can actually determine what tissue it comes from. So you can say this, there is a cancer present, and it looks like, based on the genetic makeup, that it may come from the lung or the kidney or the bladder. And that's directing you where to go and what to do about it. And when we think about how this is applied then to individual patients, the idea of, you mentioned the the screening ahead of time, screening patients. Do you anticipate a point in the future where um, we are put into these profiles of risk based on family members and we undergo this screening? Do you think this is something will be more widespread than that? That's exactly what we think will happen. We think we'll, we'll identify patients initially who have cancer and we'll find those who are at risk and we'll then contact family members and invite them to have screening and that once they're identified, they will be placed into intensive, sur- more intensive surveillance programs. The corollary of that, of course, is if you test negative, maybe you don't need as much screening. Maybe you don't need a mammogram mm-hmm. as frequently as other people or a colonoscopy as frequently as other people. Maybe we can save healthcare costs by diverting those people into less intensive screening, which is the, the positive side of things. Yeah. Health insurance is another issue. Maybe it's going to be more expensive for a subset of the population that's increased risk, but it may be much less expensive for the 85% who are not at risk. And and if I may uh, uh, expand a bit on liquid biopsy, which I thought was where you were going with this, is um, the, the, the most immediate application of it is not the screening, because screening is fraught with other issues. We've seen this play out with mammograms and with prostate-specific mm-hmm. antigen, that there are risks to screening. Um, the first implication of this is in people who already have cancer. If you already have cancer and you've been treated with chemotherapy or surgery and you want to know whether the tumor's completely gone or not, well, instead of doing PET scan or CT scans, you could use blood tests mm-hmm. to monitor the disappearance and the reappearance of the cancer, probably at a higher level of sensitivity than an X-ray or a symptom uh, requires. And we have already have clinical tests available here at Mayo Clinic in which we can do this, in, for example, in melanoma or in colon cancer. So once the patient has been treated, you can use that, the liquid biopsy, to see that the cancer is still exactly. gone or at bay? So if you're a breast cancer patient who's had chemotherapy and surgery and you want to know, well, or perhaps you've just had surgery and you want to know whether chemotherapy is required in the future, we think you might use a liquid biopsy as one way to determine did surgical resection really remove all of the tumor cells, or are there still enough left over that you can find using this <laughs> very sensitive technique? What are biomarkers, and how, how are they used? So biomarkers are uh, any measure 
biologic measure, blood, urine, uh, x-ray, in which we use those to determine prognosis, uh, and we use them to determine what drug would be most appropriate for what patient. I'll give you an example. A very popular form of cancer therapy today, which you see advertised on television a lot, is cancer immunotherapy, particularly a class of drugs we call checkpoint inhibitors. The name doesn't really matter. The point is they're very expensive drugs. They've revolutionized cancer care to a large extent because they've allowed us to move away from conventional chemotherapy. Um, and they're fantastic. They've improved survival in a whole range of cancers. However, uh, they only work about 30%, 40% of the time. A biomarker will tell you in advance whether you're likely to be a responder or a non-responder to that drug. Some of these drugs are only approved by the FDA if you do the biomarker testing beforehand. So we don't waste healthcare resources by giving the wrong drug to the wrong person, causing toxicity which without any chance of success, versus giving it to the right person at the right time. When, and I think you know this this idea. This um, there's been a lot of these therapies that we've seen in the news. We've there have been exciting articles, you know, in the lay press about them. And CAR T cells, one of those as well. I wonder, um, you know, I know CAR T cells coming soon uh, here in Rochester at a high volume. Um, lots of other places it's popping up. What's your sense on on what CAR T cell is for for those who may not understand that and just are hearing about it in the paper? These are very exciting, transformative, really. And I, and I think you should probably do a whole program on these. I'm sure you will. Um, just for the people listening, what, what, a, what this is, is we take from the patient with cancer their peripheral blood cells. Uh, we use a dialysis-like machine to collect them. They are then genetically engineered, and two genes are placed into, the, into those peripheral blood lymphocytes. We call them T cells. That's where the T comes from. And the gene that we put in is called a chimeric antigen receptor, or CAR, hence CAR T cells. But what those really are, are they train the cells to do two things. They train them first to go and find the tumor, very, a very sensitive way of detecting the tumor. And once they find the tumor, they call in their army of friends to do the, the killing of those tumor cells. This is already proven to be very successful and curative, in fact, in some childhood acute leukemias. It's now FDA approved for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. We believe it will be approved in the next year or two for multiple myeloma, uh, potentially for chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So for the blood cancers, these are really changing the way medicine and, and practice will happen. The problem today is there's a huge demand and there's a small number of slots. So there's a sort of in this sort of frustrating limbo land of uh, we know it's going to be good, but we're not able to offer to everybody today, but we do have many clinical trials around the country in almost every major academic medical center offering CAR T cells, particularly in blood cancers. We've been talking about the latest advancements in individualized cancer therapies with the director of Mayo Clinic's Center for Individualized Medicine, Dr. Keith Stewart. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, Dr. Stewart will help us preview the upcoming Mayo Clinic Conference, Individualizing Medicine 2018. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Jake Strand. And I'm Tracy McRae. Each year, Mayo Clinic sponsors the Individualized Medicine Conference, sharing the newest, cutting-edge discoveries and how they can be applied immediately to improve healthcare. This year's conference will take place September 12th and 13th, and back uh, with us to preview the conference is the director of Mayo Clinic Center for Individualized Medicine, Dr. Keith Stewart. So, Dr. Stewart, tell us a little bit about this year's lineup. Um, every year, it, it's just amazing what the speakers uh, bring to the bring to the floor. Well, this is a great conference on individualized meds. We bring uh, hundreds of people from around the world every year to Rochester, Minnesota, to participate in the latest advances. Uh, there's been huge progress since the first human genome was sequenced in 2003. In fact, this year we're just uh, delighted to have Dr. Eric Green from the NHGRI or the National Human Genome Research Institute at the NIH to come and be one of our keynote speakers to give us an update on all the progress that's been made. And what do you expect some of the other highlights might be? Well, we've got some fantastic speakers. We've talked about CAR T cells earlier today. We're, we have a speaker on that uh, very exciting topic in cancer. We're going to cover some pharmacogenomics, as we do uh, every year, which is the 
interaction of the genes you're born with with the medication you take. Uh, we have a speaker this year, I think, which is a new uh, avenue for us. We will talk about the use of X-ray imaging in individualized medicine and particularly uh, some of the use of artificial intelligence and how that might uh, interact with our individualized approaches to care. What? What? A robot? <laughs> Not a robot. Uh, <laughs> artificial intelligence, which we, we like to call uh, actually augmented human intelligence today. We d this is the use of computers to... to try and make sense of the vast amounts of data we get in healthcare through pathology reports, digital imaging of x-rays, lab tests, clinical notes, things that the human brain uh, has a hard time processing. And we can use uh, uh, machine learning, natural language processing, these are the sexy terms for these, this, this technology, to try and sort those out, make connections that human brain might not be able to make. And it's exciting. That, I mean, this is, are you talking about, for example, the, the use of Watson in clinical trial application to help us find the right trials for the right patient? Or does this even go beyond that? No, I think this goes beyond that. You know, one example recently, one of our, some of our scientists looked at the uh, uh, depression uh, and Parkinson's disease as another area, looking for connections, ways to predict outcome. To, the reason we like to call augmented human intelligence is we want to help the physician at the bedside. So the idea is that you will still, as a physician, be in charge of the patient's care, the individual patient in front of you, but you can be assisted uh, to the extent possible by a computer, by a machine that will help you sift through the mounds of data, put it in the context of all the other people out there with this disease, with these features, and try and give you some feedback and advice in your care management. Early days, just getting going, but uh, huge potential. I know in the past when you've been on, you've mentioned that pharmacogenomics, uh, that's one of the daily applications that people can use. You know, how much pain reliever do they need? Uh, is Tylenol better than Advil? You know, whatever the situation might be. Um, what other, what does the future hold for daily pharma or daily genetic use? Well, if you want to fast forward into the not so far away, but not right now future, we think at one point everybody will have their genome present in their electronic health record as part of the background of their health information. We like to think of it now, we call it the, the, the tapestry of health, uh, bringing the genomics into play. And what we, we believe will happen is that there will be, just like you have all your allergies present for the doctor to see you at the top of your chart so they don't order the wrong drug, there will also be your pharmacogenomic result, which says, for this patient, this drug is a bad idea. Hmm. Or it affects the dosage or, or wh whatever. Or, or, you know, or, for the, or for this patient, you may need to use a higher dose of, mm -hmm. of anticoagulant and antidepressant. We had a great example recently uh, in our pediatric uh, practice where we see patients, uh, young children and adolescents with uh, severe um, uh, heartburn, essentially. And we see people have been through three or four other doctors before they decide to come to Mayo Clinic. We, Dr. Abash in, in our practice applied pharmacogenomics to this group of uh, young, in, young adults and, and children uh, with quite remarkable results. First of all, about a third of the time he found that they just weren't on a high enough dose of the drug, and when he did that, they got better when he upped the dose. A third of the time he found the drug was working perfectly well, and, and the conclusion was perhaps his heartburn is not the problem. It's not why you're having chest pain and other symptoms. It, look for something else. And a third of the time they found it was actually another medication might be contributing to the problem, and it had nothing to do with the heartburn or indigestion. They, they gave an example of a kid who was uh, falling asleep in the exam room, and the parents said, yeah, he's always like that, we don't know why, and it turned out he was not metabolizing some anxiety meds he'd been placed on. And so, so there was really quite a remarkable story of how this could potentially be helpful. We've been talking with Dr. Keith Stewart, reviewing the upcoming Individualizing Medicine Conference taking place September 12th and 13th in Rochester, Minnesota. Is the public invited to this, or...? Uh, the public can come if they want, but you have to register as okay. a participant, and there is a fee for that. Dr. Stewart is director of the Center for Individualized Medicine at Mayo Clinic. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Stewart. It's been great being here again. Thank you.